Good morning. I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Minneapolis Audit Committee for Tuesday, January 26th. My name is Lene Palmasano and I'm the chair of this committee. With me on the dais are the following committee members, Council Member John Quincy, uh, Park and Recreation, oh, uh, Commissioner Tab, or Committee Member Tab is running late, but will be here, Vice Chair Mark Boyes, uh, and Member Scott Neal. Please let the record reflect that we have a quorum. Colleagues, we have a very full agenda today. We will be hearing several updates from our auditor, including completed audits, the 2015 annual report, and information about the 2016 audit plan. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda before you as presented? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the agenda. All, fav all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it and the agenda is adopted. Before we move on to today's presentation, we need to accept the minutes from our last meeting, which was on October 20th, 2015. <laughs> I'll move adoption of those minutes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and those minutes are adopted. Um, colleagues, the, ne the next item on our agenda is an addendum to the records management audit report that was presented to us and published on October 20th. Here to present is our director of audit, uh, Mr. Tetzel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Audit Committee. The, the audit team um, decided to perform some additional testing based on one of the findings in the records management uh, audit that we presented at the October meeting. And so I wanted to quickly go over the results of that. Um, the, the objective of this test was to understand the um, the access controls around PeopleSoft HR. <clears throat> and so the original, the original finding um, had misquantified um, the, the number of employees. And so we, we looked at it a different way to get a better sense of what was really going on with that. <clears throat> and so um, in w the approach that we took was looking at all employees that had terminated their employment with the city from January 1st to late November of 2015. And then we compared their date of termination to when their access to PeopleSoft HR was cut off. The challenge here and some of the results uh, aren't as conclusive as we'd like them to be is that the control that HR has in place um, and we can see that it's, it's happening um, changes someone's access to um, to self service only. That's the that's the goal. When an employee leaves the city, we allow them thirty days to go into PeopleSoft HR and look at their personal information. It might be about their retirement funds. It might be about their benefits. It might be about their paycheck. It's called self service, and um, the idea is after thirty days, then we cut that off. When when we try to go back and audit that, we can't we can't see what types of access they had before that. We can just see their last level of access. So it's hard to tell what their access was after they terminated uh, until unless they were not terminated when we pulled the data. When we pulled the data, all of the terminated employees accounts were locked after that 30 day period. What we did find there was over 1300 terminations this year um, that a little over a thousand um, the security profiles remained unlocked for that self-service over those 30 days. Um, it doesn't, that doesn't in itself propose a significant risk because all you can see is your own data. But um, the, the fact is some of these went well over 30 days and if when we finally turned it off, they did have some elevated level of PeopleSoft HR access, they could still get into some city systems. <clears throat> um, another thing is that we're, we're currently not using logging when we're making some of these changes, and that's why we can't tell what level of access that someone had prior to their, the final access that they have recorded in the system. And so I wanted to, wanted to actually draw this out because it, it might help to explain what's going on. Does this microphone work over here? Okay. So as you can see here, we have a little chronological display. <clears throat> the first Chevron being the last date of employment. And here, what the goal is, is to limit their HR profile to that self-service. 
And then the next chevron is this HR profile lock. So uh, it's, we can tell that HR has a process to go in and look for profiles that have hit that 30 day mark, that, that self-service mark, 30 days after termination, and then completely lock that profile down. <clears throat> so if we call this day zero, ideally on day zero, we'd like to limit that profile to self-service. And then between, um, or throughout the year, HR conducts this control. So it happens at various intervals. <clears throat> what we're seeing with the, with the data that we looked at this year is that um, teams within the city aren't great at always getting this information, termination information into the system or to HR. So what's happening is <clears throat> uh, we'd like to see at day 30 that account locked, but this might be day 30, let's just say day 30 plus for example sake, someone might have gone in and realized, oh, you know, we had this employee that has left the city, now we're gonna enter their termination date. So then it goes back to here and the HR control will, will, will catch that. But what the gap here is that we're not consistently getting that termination data or that information. Either the department can do it themselves, some departments do it themselves, or some departments have HR do it in a timely fashion. And that's why we're seeing the results that we're seeing. So if it's 30 plus that the backdate that we finally get that information and backdate it, then again, when that HR control functions, it'll catch that. But it's catching it after the fact because when they're running this, they're not even aware that this person is terminated. <clears throat> Mr. Tetzel, we have a question. Uh, Member Newell. Uh, Mr. Tetzel, is there, is, I, I was trying to understand this in reading it too and I couldn't, so this is helpful to me. Is there a way to fix that? Is there a, a way if, through uh, creating some kind of protocol about fixing that second date, about how many days out that could occur? Or is that not reasonable in this case? The only way to fix it is for departments to understand that it's important for them to get this information to HR timely or to their person who might administer that information in HR done in a timely fashion. This year, you know, they did, there was, this This year was a little bit unique. We had the, the PeopleSoft implementation. So there was a lot of work being done in and around PeopleSoft within HR and, and other departments. Um, but it's it's still, I think the onus really lies on supervisors and using the, the termination process. And we do, HR does have a termination process and checklists and tools out there to use it as they should be. Uh, otherwise, it's it's up to HR to, to both either run that control or have a general understanding of when someone might have quit, but that's, uh, we can't rely on that. So it's an enterprise, it's an enterprise issue. <clears throat> Member Tab. <coughs> um, is this at tied at all to payroll in any way? It shouldn't be, no. Okay, because I was just wondering if there was a way to sort of check a box if somebody was, this will, this will be this person's last paycheck or something so mm -hmm. that, you know, you have to generally, I guess, fill something out for payroll and if there was a way to tie something in. Council, or Chair Palmasano, Commissioner Tab, there's a potential for that because we can see a weakness in that control there. There's, there's a potential for an opportunity for that to happen. We'd have to do some specific testing and audit work to, to determine, around payroll, to determine whether or not people were paid beyond their last date of employment. Keep going. Um, we had several recommendations for HR, um, really starting from um, not allowing access to the system at all after those 30 days, uh, ranging to if we're gonna remain allowing this access, let's put some more controls in place. And HR was, um, they've already worked on several of these recommendations. Um, the only one that they didn't agree with was um, one of the recommendations was to um, 
to have the portal. So with, with HR, PeopleSoft HR and PeopleSoft Finance, there's a web portal that you can access that. And so <clears throat> they don't have to go through the city's network to get onto those. Um, one of the recommendations was for that portal to be self-service access only, like you couldn't have elevated access. If you were an HR supervisor or manager or director, you couldn't use the portal to do your work at home. You would have to use your laptop and VPN in and go through the network. Um, they didn't agree with that recommendation, but all the rest that they, they did agree with. Any other questions on the updated testing? Nope. Um, I'm going to ask um, when we go through the audit work plan to prioritize a little bit more analysis into this. Um, but are there any other questions from the committee on, on this one? Um, with that item, may I have a motion to receive this audit addendum report and direct staff to publish this addendum? Great. Seconded? Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Um, this report will be received and staff will publish this addendum to the report. Uh, the next report on our agenda is the report on last year's audit of the city's human resource personnel file, maintenance and retention. Uh, Mr. Tetzel. Thank you. Uh, this, which I'm going to go back. This audit came about um, when we were working on the records management audit, which was one of the large audits we did last year. Um, we, because of the scope of it, we didn't get into a detailed analysis with any, within any department about their records. Um, and with, with working with HR, the department did have an appetite for us to help them get an understanding of personnel files, which, have, which were decentralized a number of years ago in the city, to see whether or not those personnel files were maintained adequately, if the right documents were in there. Uh, if they were secured, and there's uh, each, most employees, the vast majority of them also have a medical file if those were separate from the HR files and were also secured because that has some very sensitive information in there. Uh, we felt that that was important as well. It was something that we couldn't cover in the records management audit because of uh, some scope limitations and resource limitations, so we thought that this would be a good audit, a, a somewhat quick audit to get done this or in 2015. <clears throat> There were this, and I'll note this audit did include uh, the Park and Rec Board at Commissioner Tab's request. Um, so the Park Board does have some independent HR functions, um, and so there is we we did a separate testing of the Park Board and the city, and so the findings are are separate as well. So we had three findings for the city. The first one being existence and completeness of personnel and medical files. Um, we noted that 81 out of the 107 files, there was some document that was missing. So the HR has a, a very long laundry list of things that could end up in someone's personnel file or medical file. We asked them to identify some of the key pieces or the critical pieces of information for our testing because we didn't want to test for all of them. Um, these might have ranged from an applica signed application, an offer letter. There's, there's a lot of components in there. Um, not all of these things were critical to the, the personnel file being um, unusable. If there's just pieces of information in there that weren't available. And some of them, rightfully so, we've moved to NeoGov, the new uh, recruiting and hiring system. Um, for some new employees, we noticed that some of that information was in there. It was still electronic. and so. You know, we have some commentary on that uh, that I'll talk about at the end of these findings. The second finding uh, is around accessibility and separation of personnel files. So for all the departments that we tested, we looked into where their files were kept, that they were in locked cabinets, and that the medical files were separate from the personnel files. One thing that we noted when um, departments will archive their personnel files and a number of years after an employee leaves the city. And so those will go to HR and they'll hold them for a while and then they'll send them off for longer term storage if necessary. Um, we wanted to make sure that those archived files were secure as well. Uh, they are within the HR department in a storage room. And um, the storage room is used for some other things as well. There's other things that are stored there. 
So we we got the the key logs from NBC to get a sense of how many people have potentially have access to that room where these files were uh, on cabinets, but on unlocked cabinets. So accessible to anyone that could get in the room. There was 225 keys made for that specific room, uh, and the ownership of those was was varied. Some of them were master keys. Some of them were in key boxes. But there were there were probably m much more than anyone anticipated being. So HR has already worked on on remediating this and making sure that one they get locked cabinets for that room, but but two they work through this issue. And I think they're working on electronic badge controls for that for that door there. The third finding, which was similar between the city and the park board, was around the I nine process. So. Um, HR had done some work into the accuracy of I-9s, but wanted us to look into how well we thought the I-9 representatives throughout the city understood the process and the risks and the ramifications of not performing I-9s appropriately. Uh, so we created a questionnaire, and for the city of Minneapolis, we facilitated those questions with, with a certain number of I-9 reps, and then at the park board, they did that for us and gave those results back to us. They were somewhat similar in that the reps probably need some updated understanding of why we do I-9s, how quickly we need to do them, what some of the ramifications of not doing them at all or not doing them in a timely fashion are. Um, and we noticed a direct correlation between people that do them more often and an understanding of why and how we do them and the importance. Um, there, were, there were many more I-9 reps in Park and Rec, probably because they have a lot more locations that they work in. I think anyone who was a potentially a hiring supervisor could have been an I nine rep. Or in the city, there's there's far fewer. I think there was about fifty, if I'm correct. Um, and so this can be fixed pretty easily with some some training and communication, and maybe some realignment of of who facilitates the I nine process. It is an important process. A couple of commentaries that came out of this work. Uh, the first one was around electronic files um, and we noticed and will continue to notice that we're going to have more electronic documentation of things that are going to end up in the personnel files and the medical files and so we mentioned to HR that um, they should start to consider how to handle this uh, at, at this time it, it's it's sort of unknown but anyone who should have access to the to someone's personnel's file should also have equal access to any electronic documents that we don't manually print out and put in those files. Um, so they'll, they'll come a time when the majority of them will probably be electronic, and so they need to keep in mind that um, we, should, we should think about how this evolving, the evolvement of technology is gonna impact these files and how they should continue to work with electronic files and making sure that both people have access to the ones they need, but they're also being retained in the same fashion and for the same time period as the, the manual documents that are in these files. Uh, the other one due to the noticing how many keys were made for that, that door in the HR department, um, we'd recommend that the city do a physical access review um, for, for doors that still have keys, not electronic badges, to maybe get a quick sense of of how many are out there and is there a need to rekey some of the doors in the city? Uh, are the controls adequate about getting keys back from terminated employees, either back to, to um, MMB or to the department so they can do with it what they need to? But it, it seems like there's an opportunity there to, to m mitigate some physical access uh, opportunities that we see. Any questions on the HR personnel file audit? Um, I think Council Member Kano, you have your flag up. Do you have a question? No. Um, any other questions from the committee? Um, I've had the opportunity to speak, you know, through agenda setting and that sort of thing um, with our director of HR, and and I know that um, the purview of this committee is not to direct uh, work of our enterprise departments. Um, I do appreciate the conversations that we've had in this. Um, I welcome it, if uh, someone from HR, if Mr. Champa, who I see here in the audience, wants to 
comment on some of the work already being done um, to mitigate these things, um, I welcome that if you wanted to just come up. And then I also know we have Teresa Chaika in the audience. Um, if you'd like to, you know, comment on, on some of these. I know that a lot of this was useful work. Um, I know that we're already doing a lot of good things here to remediate it um, long before we were able to bring it here with the final report. But just through the scope of this, this is a really healthy thing. Um, Mr. Champla, did you want to say just a few words? Yes, thank you. I'm Bill Champa from Human Resources. I'm a manager and I'm here representing uh, Chief HR Officer uh, Patience Ferguson. And so first of all, I want to thank uh, the committee and I want to thank Will Tetzel. This is a um, audit that we actually asked for, um, as he mentioned. And so this is very important information to us. Um, uh, Patience Ferguson has been with the city for two years and this has been a, a, a big priority since she's been here and we were um, we've been working on some of these and uh, this reaffirmed a lot of what we um, already um, thought we knew but this was very reaffirming to us and and quite helpful um, so a couple of quick things of what uh, what we've been doing uh, the access to the room um, first of all I'll I will tell you that that's a room, a storage room that not many people in HR even know exists. That said, there's the key access and there's that problem. We've already uh, remedied that. We're in the process of changing that. So uh, the only two people have access to that room, two trained people. Um, in addition, we're working longer term on the card access so we know exactly who goes in and out of that room. Um, and can audit that uh, on an annual basis. So um, we're working on that. We're also working on locked file cabinets in, in that room. And um, I think the biggest, the biggest piece uh, that this report reaffirmed and that I think many of your que questions uh, address is really the, um, the responsibility out in our departments. We have um, a couple of different key personnel. Um, this process is largely decentralized, the, the maintenance of personnel and medical files. So educating those folks, um, training those folks, and then holding them accountable is extremely important. And we're working on all three of those. Um, we have uh, started, uh, we've uh, designated uh, an HR staff person to lead this work. Um, and to uh, work with the departments um, to kind of tighten this up and clean this up. So um, I'd okay. take any questions. If Thank you. Any questions? No. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Cheka, did you want to come up and just say a few words about this engagement and your perspective on it? Commissioner Tab, uh, committee members, I appreciate uh, you allowing me to come up. Um, I appreciated that Commissioner Tab invited us to be a part of this. It doesn't hurt to be checked on. And um, we are separate from the city. You know, we, we work with them in HR on some things. Our file room and the I-9 process is separate. Uh, we have the luxury of having much smaller amounts of data and it's in one spot. Um, I can say that the security, what wasn't mentioned is all the doors, in fact, two of them. We have an IT, we have smart cards. So that can be turned off instantly, which is nice that uh, we can control who has access. We do file, our filing system is different, and we um, started about eight years ago. Uh, the League of Minnesota Cities recommends we have separate files, and it's, it's more efficient for us, and I know the city probably can't do that, but when a supervisor wants to come in because our people move around, they bid and they move around, and they want to see the performance, all we have to do is, as a small HR department, pull out that performance file. We don't have to go through the whole personnel file to pull it out. We find it really efficient. Um, as far as the I-9s, um, to go back to our personnel files, we've had uh, NeoGov much longer than the city did, which is the electric, electronic hiring process. So our applications were electronic much sooner than the city was. So I think that that kind of got reflected in the audit. We didn't have them, they're electronic, whereas the city wasn't. For the I-9, we are um, looking to go back to E-Verify. We had E-Verify many years ago, and it was in conflict with 
the city, they had to stop um, because of the the judges or something was coming on, and we we just they, we had to stop it. But we're going back to it. We found we can do it separate from the city, and the city's doing it. We will retrain our supervisors. That was one of the recommendations. 2016 budget has a trainer coming on board, and that is one of our objectives is to get our supervisors trained on everything up to date. So I appreciate you listening, and, and we look forward to being able to talk about the improvements we've made to our policies and the I-9 process. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your interest and for seeking out internal audit to do this specific audit. Uh, you know, this is a healthy process. We learn things, and the great thing is that as soon as we do, uh, our departments take immediate action to, to fortify and correct our processes. So uh, I'm, I'm glad about that. Um, super. Thank, thank you. you. May I have a motion to receive the human resources personnel file maintenance and retention audit report and direct staff to publish this report? So moved. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and the report will be received and the staff will publish it. Next on our agenda is the Internal Audit Department's annual report for 2015, summarizing our 2015 audit plan and those results. Uh, also, client satisfaction surveys and staff editing and budgeting request updates. Um, Mr. Tetzel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, the ordinance for the city requires that um, internal audit publish an annual report, but not what was in it. So <clears throat> we gave it a shot. I um, appreciate any feedback for information that you guys would like to see in there or would expect to see in there. Um, I'll give you some highlights. You received the report. Um, <clears throat> we had six projects that we completed this year, two audits and four consultations. Out of those, we had 15 findings, or out of the two audits, we had 15 findings. So a consultation won't have findings per se. Um, those findings consisted of 33 recommendations. So a finding really talks about a risk that needs to be addressed and there might be multiple recommendations within that finding. <clears throat> the four consultations resulted in 46 recommendations, so in total, we had 79 recommendations in 2015 in the work that we did, 98% of which were agreed upon by management. Um, and I mentioned the one that wasn't before. Um, the reason that we talk about management agreement is because it's a measure of the reasonableness of, of the work that we're doing and what what's achievable for the enterprise. Um, there's a lot of recommendations that you could make to completely fortify a process or a department or a system, but um, there's a cost to doing that. And so we really strive to work with departments um, and some departments can do it very well on their own to come up with um, appropriate remediation actions and responses to the work that we do. And so far that's, that's gone well. <clears throat> Follow-up is another key aspect of uh, the work that internal audit does uh, with the findings that we have. Um, without following up on them, the city would never know whether or not anything is, is changing. And so follow-up activity will continue to consume our time and it'll probably gradually increase, uh, hopefully to a plateau, and then and then we can keep it there. Um, we had, we When I joined uh, a little over a year ago, the prior audit team had I think about 24 audit findings that were still outstanding. So we decided that we should work on closing those out. So we've closed out 21 of those in 2015, uh, some of which were folded into some findings and recommendations that we had in some of our current bodies of work. Some of them were folded into some of the state auditor findings that the finance department is working on. So rather than uh, Sort of double dip on some of that work, we found that there was some parallels between issues that, that the auditor had seen in the past and some of the things that are currently being worked on here in the future. So we made a note to aggregate those and close them out together. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, the audits done in 2015 produced 14 findings. When, when we issue an audit report, management will respond to that report. Uh, sometimes those responses will include a remediation plan and and dates and such. Sometimes they don't because they need to go back and figure out exactly how to do that. So sh we'll be working here in short order with these 14 findings in the departments that they're 
related to to understand what their remediation plans are, get some goals in there for dates, and then build out our spreadsheet so we can start tracking those. Uh, you'll hear much more about that in the, in the next meeting in March. <clears throat> Lastly, I wanted to talk about client satisfaction surveys. Um, I, uh, I pinged a couple peer city auditors to find out how they were surveying their clients and got a few examples of surveys and then took the questions on there that I thought were applicable to us. Um, we tried to keep them pretty general so it wasn't, we didn't elicit emotional responses. Most people don't enjoy being audited. Uh, and so we didn't wanna let people take that out on us, but rather um, how, you know, how well are we doing, what we should be doing from a, from a communication perspective, from a timing perspective. There are a few categories there. So uh, audit planning, quality reporting, timing, communication, and recommendations. Um, the survey results um, came in at an average of 82%, uh, which I think is a, is a decent balance. Um, too high, and I would question whether or not we're being too easy on people or um, not digging deep enough into some of the real issues too low and we're probably not doing our job well enough or communicating well enough or uh, creating hostile environments, so on and so forth. So I think 82 is a good spot to be there in that satisfaction survey. Mr. Tetzel, uh, we have a question from or a comment from Mr. Oyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, yeah, I looked at the materials ahead of time. Really, I did. And I was wondering what bothered me about the 82%. And it's I'm just curious about the individual, the four components of that. Where are we stronger? Where are we, you know, usually what my experience has been is when you get to the recommendations part, it goes, you know, mm -hmm. sort of lower, it would drag the aggregate down. Is there, or would you say 82 represents the client satisfaction across the four items that you looked at or asked for? Yeah, so I'll tell you how we calculated these uh, and then speak to that, uh, Madam Chair, and the council member ways. <clears throat> um, so as to not skew the results, we we took we we created a score for each project um, because some of the projects might have ten respondents, some might have one or two, and so we didn't want those ten to over skew the score. So each each um, project that we have gets its individual score, and it's based on those five components. In looking at those five components in aggregate, there's a little shift towards some you know higher scores in in timing and in uh, communication and a little bit lower in recommendations, but nothing that really got my attention. Maybe, maybe you know, five points or, or lower. Uh, and I can send you some of that that detail. I have that in a spreadsheet if you need it. Uh, Mr. Tetzel, that, th thank you very much. That's fine. I just wondered if we're still kind of dragging around on the, the, the recommendations, but it sounds like that's um, comparable to all the, the other four components. So, thank you. The annual report also includes some language around our, our mission and our, our vision. Um, nothing to really comment on here, but that's that for the for the annual report. Mr. Tetzel, um, I just want to say this is exactly what I'd hoped for when we imagined a fully functional audit team a couple years ago. Um, we've cleaned up old findings. We've, you know. I, I, I hope people are all pleased with that. We've we've got a feedback loop, a productive feedback loop, and that's really important and about our working relationship as an internal audit group with um, clients around the enterprise. Um, are there any thoughts or questions from others? Um, may I have a motion to receive and file the 2015 internal audit annual Thank report? You. Great. Second? Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, the report will be received and staff will publish it. Um, I'm also pleased that our last item <clears throat> under new business today is the 2016 audit plan. Part of our role as a committee is to review and approve a yearly audit plan uh, that guides the work of our audit department through the rest of the year. So, Mr. Tetzel, could you go forward with what we will do this year? Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Um, the, the process to come to our audit plan was similar to last year. We conduct risk assessment meetings with departments and divisional leaders. We solicit information from council and from the mayor's office. 
and we just gather information from the work that we do and the experiences we have and the meetings that we have throughout the year. So it's <clears throat> it's a continual process. And um, I wanna note that, that again, the audit plan is a point in time. Um, we always try to stay as appraised as we can on emerging risks and if something um, comes up that is more important or more pressing than something that's on the plan, um, we like to exercise our, our right to, to reprioritize and change that and um, and my job is to, is to communicate that to the audit committee. Um, if there's something that comes up that I, that I don't agree with or that I um, would like the committee's opinion on, then I'll wait till the next meeting. Otherwise, I'll typically run it by the chair and, and make some of those changes as they occur. The 2015 plan changed dramatically, um, as was expected. We didn't get to all the departments um, before we put the plan out, so we met with Public Works and CPED over the summer, and, and those meetings drove some pretty significant changes in the plan. The 2016 audit plan consists of 14 projects. Four of those are carryover projects from last year, and I'll talk about those as well. Uh, there's eight audits, five consultations, and one program audit, and that program audit is a carryover from the prior year. Um, so I'll go through the projects on the list, and then you can either interrupt or we can talk about questions at the end. <clears throat> These are in alphabetical order. They're not prioritized in order of risk or importance, um, but the 2016 ones are first, and then the carryover ones are the last four, so they're not mixed in together. Uh, the first project is an audit of the accounts payable um, processes here, and the objective is to evaluate key processes and controls around payment timeliness, accuracy, and fraud. The next project is a civil rights contract compliance audit, and the objective of this audit is to review the processes and regulation in place for civil rights contracting requirements and review the execution consistency and accuracy of the respective processes. The third project is around IT projects management. Um, this is a consultation, and the objective of this consultation is to determine if the city has adequate project management processes and tools to guide system implementations. I wanna note here, right now we're experiencing a lot of system implementations at the city, rightfully so. <clears throat> the, the management of those projects doesn't solely lie on the IT department. Uh, certain departments are um, all over the spectrum in how engaged they are in in a, a project implementation, and so this isn't specifically focused on the IT PMO, although there'll be uh, a core piece of this work. Uh, it'll include also the city department's participation in this. The next project on the list is a license plate reader pre-requirement review. This is a consultation. Um, the police department uses the license plate reader software, and there is some legislation out there that it will require a biannual review of this, uh, the first audit, or a biannual audit, sorry. <clears throat> the first audit will be due in 2017, and so the police department wanted us to come in and look at that license plate reader program, and based on some of the language in that legislation, give the city an opinion of, of anything that they need to improve to prepare themselves for, these, for this audit. Uh, if the audit goes well and there aren't any recommendations, we'll probably look to to post this as the first the first required audit of the system. So it'll be it'll be similar to what we would do in the next steps. But this is really a proactive approach to making sure that that the controls and processes in place around this are are adequate. The next project on the audit plan is a is on the Park and Rec Board. It's around worker safety, and this is a this is an audit, and the objective of that is to determine if the Park and Rec Board has practices and procedures in place to both prevent injuries and adequately address injuries that do happen. Um, the Park Board is, has done quite a bit of work around this as of late, and um, they've asked us to come in and help them get an understanding of, of how adequate those processes are, if anything needs to be uh, altered based on that, and, and how well that's performing. Um, also identify any gaps in, in, in those practices as well. The next project on the plan is off-street parking operator, and this is an audit with an objective to evaluate the service level agreements and city and vendors' adherence to contractual requirements. 
as you all probably are aware of, uh, in October of 2015, we um, continued to work uh, under ABM to operate the off-street parking in the city. Uh, the, the contract is somewhat different than it has been in the past. Um, this has been audited before by the, the prior audit team, um, but Public Works and the audit department agreed that it'd be good to look at this again uh, under the new contractual terms um, and potentially a different scope than what was done in the past. The next project on the list is a PeopleSoft Finance Access Audit. Similar to the work that I presented first here in the meeting, um, we've, we've done some pretty significant access testing on the HR PeopleSoft module. We wanna do that same thing on the Finance PeopleSoft module. Um, part of that being that the city doesn't have <clears throat> an enterprise-wide approach to monitor system access. And so um, we're gonna hit some of these big systems and then um, work with, with departments or um, divisions to, to see if we can improve our, our access monitoring within the city. Uh, the next project is um, PeopleSoft Web Portal Security. Uh, and this is an audit and the objective to determine the adequacy of security controls for the PeopleSoft Web Portal. So if you'll remember, we, we talked about um, the HR access to PeopleSoft. There's, there's a web portal for um, PeopleSoft Finance and PeopleSoft HR where an employee can access that system remotely, not through the federated network. And so we want to look at some of this, the security um, controls that we have on that web portal to make sure that um, they're adequate enough to prevent any malicious activity. Uh, the next project is a police body camera pre-requirement review. So similar to the license plate reader, um, right now there's pending legislation of a tri-annual audit of body camera processes around the data that's collected there. Um, so as we get a better understanding of the language and where that's landing, um, the police department again asks us to come in similarly to the body camera pilot program consultation that we did last year, uh, help them understand any gaps or opportunities that they have in adhering to the triannual audit requirements uh, going forward. Uh, the next, the last of the Mr. 20... Tetzel? Just real sure. quickly, uh, Mr. Tetzel, the, in the um, audit plan, it was a cut and paste, and so it repeats the license plate reader down there. Um, not, not Maybe not on the on the PowerPoint, but in this, this bad boy. I'm sorry. Mr. Tetzel? In this, in this one, just take, you know, it's just a, it needs... To clarify and that okay. it's body cam. Gotcha. So, no big deal. <clears throat> Just we don't want to publish it with that in, in there. So okay. Yep, I'll fix that. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, the last of the 2016 projects, transportation management organization. Um, this is an audit around third party governance, which I'll talk about in my auditor update. Um, and this audit, the objective will be um, looking into some grant compliance, but not limited to that. Uh, there's an organization called Move Minneapolis under the TMO that will be doing some audit work around. The last four projects I'll go through a little bit quicker because you've heard about them before. Uh, CPED loan lifecycle, we're in the field work phase of that. Um, it's a very large audit. I would anticipate that coming to the May audit committee meeting. Uh, ELMS, which is Enterprise Land Management System Implementation. Um, there's some sort of ad hoc uh, consulting that we do on that. Uh, that. I think that is slated for an October implementation of October 2016 implementation there. Um, there's the NCR Neighborhood Programming and Support Program Audit that we've outsourced. That should come to the March Audit Committee meeting. They're wrapping up some final pieces of that report. And lastly, police records management system implementation. Um, this was something that was on the plan for last year, um, but it's the bulk of the work is will happen this year. They're in contract negotiations now, so we'll plug in a little bit later in the year to um, to help the police department understand some of the configuration considerations they they're making and um, just generally address some of the risks of such a large scale system implementation that touches so many other systems within it. 
at that, um, I'd like to invite our IT auditors to, to come up and quickly just talk about the audit plan and the audit planning process. Oh, thank you. Before you do, um, Mr. Neal has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one quick question, Mr. Tetzel. Uh, concerning the scope of the civil rights contract compliance audit, uh, just a scoping question. Um, it says review the, the execution, consistency, and accuracy of the respective processes. I take it you're just, the scope of your audit is just to look at how the contract is, the solicitation process and the award process. You're not following it all the way through to the end to see if what was contracted for was actually provided or, or not. Madam Chair, Mr. Neal, correct. Yeah, it'll, it'll just focus on some of those requirements that, that the city has through the Civil Rights Department that they, that they uphold there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you wanted to invite up Mr. Homestead to say a few words? Mr. Homestead. Madam Chair, Council Members, my name is Tim Homestead. I work with Backbone Consultants. We provide the IT audit services for the City of Minneapolis. I um, just wanted to talk about how we completed the IT audit risk assessment in alignment and coordination with Will Tetzel and his team. We um, took the approach very similar to, um, to Will's um, operational audit staff where we interviewed key leaders, key stakeholders, um, and key project managers to identify um, projects in scope for this year. We based the um, analysis on inherent risk, the project scope, the service impacts of the organization, as well as the previous audit date. And we used uh, the framework that's based on the Government Accountability Office, um, Federal Information Systems Control um, Framework. So based on that, we identified a list of primary projects to focus on throughout the year, um, as well as some additional secondary projects which didn't um, meet the criteria to fall into the primary projects based on either risk, um, resource availability, um, but as Will mentioned, um, uh, based on emerging risk, additional items may be moved into the, the primary focus for um, the 2016 proposed audit strategy. Are there any questions related to the IT audit scope for no. this year? Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um. <clears throat> I did want to mention that um, although it's a challenge, we had a, a huge amount of potential projects for this year or so. It really speaks volumes to uh, how forthcoming department heads and divisional leaders were in our risk assessment process. Um, there's there's a, still a really high demand for the services and the value that we can provide to the city. So um, the challenge being balancing what people ask for with what we independently think the city needs from an audit perspective. Um, but it, that's a good problem to have from my standpoint. Super, uh, here, this is the end then of the presentation on the audit plan. Super, with acknowledgement, this is a guide and we're constantly assessing risks and there's a lot um, that you're looking at. May I have a motion to receive and file this 2016 annual audit plan? Super, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and that report will be received, um, and I'll direct staff to publish it. I also have, um, from your earlier presentation, Mr. Tetzel, um, I, I want to make a staff direction in regards to the 2016 audit plan. Um, thank you for this audit plan. It, this plan and the items on it vary a lot in, um, in size and in scope. Um, I, I like that most of them were were ones that we were requested to do, and not all of them. Uh, some are on the leading edge of policy, like data privacy standards and the like. Um, I think that's going to be really informative and, and help us to really stay on top of those things. Um, some is on all the flux of multiple IT system implementations going on, which we all feel the pain of around the enterprise and from our customer service standpoint, from the public that we serve. Um, uh, I really appreciate that in, in light of um, the human resources personnel file maintenance and audit report and some of the things that came up in that, I'd like to make a motion uh, to direct staff that within the scope of the 2016 work plan, could you analyze the enterprise practices for employees that terminate employment with the city? Um, could, you report, could you report back on this 
plan update, you know, how that might fit into this 2016 plan at your next, at our next scheduled audit committee meeting. Um, I'm curious what policy issues could be put in place given best practices research. I'm curious what are recommendations and methods that could help us drive a better accountability to be really diligent when an employee leaves the city for us to be um, very specific. It seems like in part that accountability isn't really with HR, but it's with the individual departments and that's hard to make consistent. But I know there's some things out there that we could do to make a pretty, um, to help drive accountability, to make a, an impact fairly quickly here. Um, so I, I'd like to put, make that motion to try and incorporate an analysis of that within this year's audit plan. Could I have a second? Super. Um, a motion on this, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, Mr. Tetzel, you also have an update for, for us um, on previous motions. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so as, a, as we typically handle, uh, I'm, I wanna use this time to update you on our, our progress to date. Um, right now we have uh, four projects in motion. The, uh, and I've, I've spoken to these, these are the four that rolled over from 2015. Um, we don't just stop working on something uh, if the year rolls over and the audit plan rolls over, so we'll continue to, to see those projects to closure. The only one that's significant is the CPED loan audit. The rest of them are, are, are really winding down. Um, you have asked in the past for an update on the state auditor findings. and. Um, what we do uh, and what we've, what we've done here is um, we don't, I wanna be clear on, on what's getting presented here. Audit does not go in and validate um, the remediation of the state auditor findings. Rather, we just corroborate with the finance department, specifically the controller on their progress to date and then keep you guys appraised of what that is. Uh, happily, there's really just two things that are outstanding. One is around loan C documentation. Um, that's gonna require a system implementation, and so that's why you see an August of 2017 date. Uh, the MIN system, which they're currently using, uh, is getting replaced, and it's something that we're uh, helping them look at and helping IT gather some minimum requirements on in, in the work that we're doing. And, um, and the other one being the prompt payment of invoices, and they're continually working on that, I will say, um, but by, by June, I think we hope to see that uh, finding drop off of the audit or the, the state auditor's report. Um, in meeting with, with AP in our risk assessment process, we got a better understanding of why we're, why we're seeing these late payments on the state auditor's report or, or their opinion of it. And it's not that the invoice doesn't get to AP timely, it's that it doesn't get back AP sends it out for approval and coding that sometimes it doesn't get back to them in enough time for them to payment to pay it. So they won't pay it in, until it's approved by the appropriate person in the city. Uh, and sometimes those approvals can take a while because uh, either the invoice isn't clear and it gets potentially misrouted or there's a lot of information that the person on there needs to check off to make sure that we are paying it. So uh, we're, we're gonna look into that a little bit more in the AP work that we're doing in 2016 um, and then we're also looking into some of the language uh, in, the re in that requirement. I think it's a 35 day requirement. Uh, according to AP, it's, it should be 35 days based on a clean invoice. Sometimes we don't even get a clean invoice. So making sure that when we get findings like this from the state that, that the, those two dates they're comparing are from that clean invoice date, not just the invoice date uh, that comes from a, from a vendor. I mean, you could put any invoice that you wanted onto it. You could, put it already a year past and once we get it, it's already overdue. <clears throat> so hopefully that'll help out a little bit. So it feels like they're making uh, great progress on the state auditor findings, which we're happy to see. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned before, but I'll bring it up again. There's, uh, there's three of the 24 um, findings from the prior audit team left open. We're currently working on those and uh, getting traction on those. And uh, the two audits from 2015 
produce those 14 findings. Again, working with those departments and leaders on their remediation plans and dates, and we'll have, once we get that solidified, um, that'll be much more transparent to myself and the audit committee, and then we will um, stay appraised of the progress on those and report to you um, at, at each meeting. Um, one of the things that I mentioned last year was this idea of third-party governance, and so I wanted to get back to it because we're solidifying this more and more in the audit department. Um, I'll first explain what I mean by third-party governance. Um, a third party could be a vendor, it could be a partner, a strategic partner, it could be a grant subrecipient, uh, any entity that we contract with or work through to do to provide services or do something on behalf of the city. Um, a, th a theme just in the audit world in general has been emerging in, in the prior years around how organizations govern third parties and what levels of controls and processes they need to make sure that the, the higher risk areas that you have when you ask someone to do something on your behalf or procure things from, from other entities. And so we, um, we've done a few things here. One, we put together this, um, this illustration to help understand <clears throat> how we're gonna approach this work. And if you remember in some of our earlier discussions, we talked about this, this three lines of defense, that the internal audit model, three lines of defense. We take that same approach with third party governance and trying to illustrate how or visualize what this looks like. So the first line of defense for the city is really the contract execution or the grant execution and that vendor risk management. This happens with the uh, city employees who deal directly with these third parties. Um, it usually lives in the departments. Um, the second line of defense are functions of the enterprise that help facilitate that process. So contract management, finance management, grant management, IT security management, um, the city attorneys. So there's, there's a lot of functions that happen within the city to, to help that first line of defense when they both arrange um, for a contract to be executed, but in the facilitation of the continual facilitation of that. Again, we see ourselves as, as that third line of defense, but um, differently from the the models that you've seen before, not only do we plan on doing work around the first line of defense and the second line of defense, but we're gonna get audit coverage with that, with those third parties. Uh, and you've seen that in the 2016 audit plan, the, the TMO audit that we're doing. So we do wanna make sure that we're, that we look at the landscape of our third parties and uh, with the limited resources that we have adequately address some of those high risk areas. Um, this will include auditing some third parties, but um, some of that work will be looking at what we do here in the city and how we manage that effectively. Thank you. I just want to jump in here and say, yeah, this is this speaks to um, one of the audits, a fairly small audit um, on our 2016 work plan. It It is important, and we have seen in the past when we've worked with partners that didn't have the kinds of checks and balances that we expect uh, from from a city relationship. Uh, while we only have a very limited bandwidth to do these, and we have a lot of small partners, organizations that we work with, as we should, um, it, it is important to put them on notice that they may be audited by our city's internal audit team. Uh, so thank you. This is, uh, this is an important aspect, and this is part of our total risk picture. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a few things that we're doing in, in this regard to third-party governance um, we're, we're building out some templates for departments to use so they can sort of plot their third parties and, and help get a visual understanding of where those high risk ones are, where they should be focusing some of their activities. Uh, we're also developing some sort of core audit procedures. So if we're doing an audit of an area and it happens to be something where there's a, a third party involved, we can pull some of these proced standard procedures out and execute them where they make sense against some of this work and, and sort of get that coverage, you know, push this theme through, through some of the work that we're already doing. So we're putting together some of those like sort of standard audit procedures that we can plug and play into some of the audit work that we're gonna pull off this year. Uh, and then accounts payable, the, uh, the accounts payable audit on the audit plan, 
is also, if you think about it, a second line of defense here in the, in the third party governance work. So we're gonna look at them and get an understanding of some of the, how they're managing some of that third party risk that they own from an accounts payable perspective. This, this is a, it's a big effort and it'll, it'll roll out sort of slowly, but we, we wanna start a little bit stronger this year in, in getting departments involved. We can't force anyone to, but if we give them tools that they'll hopefully use, uh, we can help them understand how to use those better. And that in turn helps us understand where some of the, the bigger risk lies with some of these third parties. Yep. Great. Um, questions or comments on this part? No? Uh, may I have a motion to receive and file the update from the internal auditor? Can I do that? Please. Thank you. Uh, so much. Thank you. Uh, seconded? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and this report will be uh, received and filed. The next item on our agenda is the performance review of our internal auditor, Will Tetzel. The committee will adjourn to room 321. That's the Weber Pond room. And for those on the dais, that's off to your right uh, for that performance review, and we'll be looking to have a closed session on that. Thank you.